Hey, what's up guys? I'm here with Bob Waltzak in Wayne, New Jersey. Bob is where I worked, or, or the woodworker is where I worked uh, when I was in high school, and that's where I learned all my woodworking skills. Yeah. Well, when I first started, Kevin was working here. Oh, you got a good memory. Well, it was just uh, kind of a, only for four years for me, where it's been about probably close to 40 years for you. Yeah. So um, you've probably had a couple of people come in and out of here. <laughs> Quite a few, yeah. Not that many, though. You know, over the years, I just had maybe 20 employees total. Really? You know, they stayed a long time, usually. Well, I was you here. Kirk? Kirk was great. Yeah. Have you ever seen Kirk? Well, Kirk, um, he went to Virginia, and um, he was working in, he was he's a cabinet maker. He is a cabinet mm -hmm. maker. He went to school for that, I yeah, remember he him. Went to, he went to Ro uh, Rochester Institute for cabinet making. And um, a little artsy, you know, yeah. very artsy. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff we did here. You know, you know, it was a creative shop. We did different things, you know, we tried to anyway. Well, you bought the creative. What I was always impressed with is how you could draw plans freehand, yeah. come up with a, a design and price it. That was impressive to me. And, and actually keep this whole thing rolling and growing. You've been here for 30 years? 40. In this building for 40? 37, I think. 37 or 38 years, yeah. 37. Yeah, Bill worked here for 31 years. Bill worked here for 31 years. Yeah. Wow. 31 years. Uh, I spent two years in the Army, and then I went to, uh, then I came out of the Army, and I worked in an advertising agency. So, so how'd you get into woodworking? Um, I wanted to make my own bedroom set because I couldn't afford to buy it. We were married. I was married and we didn't have, we were having expecting a child, Ryan, and um, I worked in a furniture store. The guy hired me to be, I used to do his ads, you know, I used to draw the ads for his, for his, for his um, newspaper ads and he asked me if I wanted to um, work here. And he asked me how much I made. I told him I made $60 a week. And he goes, $60 a week? I'll give you 120 a week to start running the furniture store. So I couldn't turn it down. I had to take it. And that's what I did. I started working in the furniture store and I started looking at the drawers and how everything was put together. And, and then I made my own bedroom set. And that's how I started it. And then I opened up a shop. I had a, a, a Craftsman radio arm saw, a uh, bunch of little equipment, you know, and that's how I started. And then I had a good friend who um, told me I should get out of Bloomingdale. I was in Bloomingdale at the time. I should find something and, and, and uh, open up a, a buy my own building. And I told him I couldn't buy it. He told me to, um, that he would help me. And that was a, a great friend. And he, we both bought this building together and I completely gutted it and, and um, I paid him off. And I own the building for probably 30 years now, all my own, you know? Can you tell me a little bit more about your first shop and what projects or what, uh, what things you were mainly making for your customers? The probably when we first started, we were making pine furniture, a lot of pine furniture. That's all we ever made. That's all I, I used to buy pine, uh, straight pine, sugar pine from a place in Passaic. And that's, uh, we bought sugar pine. It was dressed all four sides and we made pine furniture and pine tables. And I used to turn my own legs and I, I did the whole thing. And then uh, when we moved here, uh, it got bigger and bigger and I, I hired people and um, and then we started making built-ins and um, you know, a little more refined furniture. And we got to, to the point where we were making, probably someday they're gonna be antiques, you know? I remember when, when I worked here, it was just the house. Yeah. And there was a small addition on the house and the front of the house was a showroom Correct. for the things that you made. Yeah. And the back, I would would estimate maybe 800 to 1,000 square feet of shop space. Yeah. 
and that was probably around 1986 to 1990. When did you build the big addition that we're, that we're in right now? This addition has been here for almost 20 years. This is about 20 years old, this addition. Huge, so, huge uh, change. Huge, it was twice as big as what we had. We put 3,000 square feet onto the building. We added on, you know. Do you know the measurements of this building? 30 by 70. This is 30 by 70? Yeah. It's a good size for a shop. Yeah, it's beautiful. Would you have done anything different? No. 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 I like the whole thing. I like everything about this place. I like the color. I like everything. The, the wood floors, it's comfortable on your feet, you know? It's a plywood floor painted? Yeah. That's all it is, you know? So now you're retiring. You're selling the building, selling most of your machines. Are you going to have a shop? I'm going to have a little shop in a garage that I in, in my home. That's just a small shop. I'm going to continue to make picture frames, and uh, for the for the paintings that I do, I'm a painter now, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make picture frames, and I'm going to sell art. What tools do you think you'll have in the the, the small shop? I'm going to have a radial alarm saw. Uh, a molder and um, maybe a couple of routers and just small equipment you know I have all the fest tools so uh, I'll probably be keeping all of those I have the, uh, the biscuit uh, uh, joiner and I have uh, their saw I have everything so I have enough to to make anything I want no table saw I have a little portable table saw but nothing nothing major you know small one what has the majority of your business been for the last 10 years? I mean, so kitchen cabinets, um, built-ins, freestanding furniture. You must have seen the business sort of move in different uh, ways over the years. I, when, when I was working with you, in the beginning, it was most... I actually built a lot of things with pine with you. Yeah. Um, it's funny because now I have a terrible allergy to pine. I can't... I can't cut it on the table, so I'll break out in a rash. Wow, really? Same stuff, sugar pond. Uh, but when that's because of the sap. The sap. Yeah, I didn't know what it was. I, I was just coming up with these rashes. Now I, I barely even touch it. I can use cedar. I can use just about everything else, but I stay away from pine. Douglas fir. I can cut Douglas fir. Um, so when I started with you, we were making a lot of things out of pine, end tables, bureaus, stand-up furniture. We weren't doing a lot of built-ins. When I left and Bob and Bill came in, we started to do a lot more built-ins uh, where we would bring the cabinets and, and then install molding all around the cabinets. Right. And that's when there are a lot of big TVs. So it makes me think about these big cabinets that had to house these gigantic TVs that are 35 inches deep. Right. Like when we first started, we did do a lot of tables and, and freestanding furniture. And then as things got, um, as we were in business longer and longer, uh, we got less and less asks, uh, jobs from, uh, uh, for the furniture because people were buying it from um, um, department stores where they were selling things from China. And that's what was, that was affecting us because of the cost. Because everything was made here, our labor cost, our material cost, cost more just the materials alone cost us more than they were selling it for. So that was really putting a kibosh on freestanding peak furniture. Then we went into more of a, a build, building bathroom vanities, building kitchens, and building uh, mudrooms and uh, all things like that. And that's where we, we've been doing that for many years now, building fine kitchens and nice vanities, different things that you can't buy from, from you know, the department store. Uh, these are a few questions from some of my viewers. This is from Michael Coghill. Oh no, <laughs> this, I'm not, I don't know if I want to answer this, ask this one. What was John like as an employee? Ha ha ha, he says. <laughs> uh, John was good. That's good. John was a good hard worker. You know, he listened. He had his own opinions on certain things, but he came to work every day on time and worked it was, it was hard work. 
It was fun work. It was fun work, but yeah. it was funny when I look back at it, because we worked. I'll come into this screen for a minute. So when I started working for Bob, I was a junior, I think, in high school. And I must have just got my license, because this is about 15 minutes from where I lived. And um, I, would leave, I was in a work-study program. So I would leave school at 11. I would get here at 12, and we would work till 6. So every day, when I look back at that, that was a pretty good schedule for a 17-year-old. Yeah. I just don't see a lot of kids doing that today. Yeah. Uh, my kids are good. My kids are working at the Navison Country Club as caddies, caddies, and, caddies and bag room, yeah. and they work hard. And yeah. but they make good money too. I'm really. Yeah. Michael was supposed to work for me this summer doing digital stuff or, or Instagram stuff. You couldn't pay him enough. No, he's doing he's doing all this stuff. Uh, right. But <clears throat> they were at work Saturday and Sunday. They left the house at 5:40 in the morning. They got home at 8:30 at night. But they like it. They, there's good people there. Uh, my son, my, my son Jack worked there also. But anyway, when I think about um, when I think about working here, it was a good amount of hours because that would be a full week, Monday to Friday, twelve to six. Might have been one. I think I started at one. One o'clock. Because it was probably after your lunch. Yeah. It's probably one to six, and then I would work Saturday mornings, eight to twelve sometimes eight to two, depending on, but mostly it was like eight to 12. I remember it was four hours because some of those <laughs> Friday nights, it was hard for me to get up and get into work. Um, and, and I remember when, it, when time went on, there was a few times when you would go on vacation, I would watch a shop. Oh, really? Yeah, where, and this is back, I don't know, do you still have oil heat here? Uh, in the other building I do, yeah. In the yeah, <clears throat> so I remember having to deal with the oil heat guy. One time I had to call Bill because there was some issue uh, with the furnace. I don't know what it was. It wouldn't kick on and it was in the winter time. And um, I have to say I learned a lot here. Uh, and I was a good work. I wasn't the best. But I had a natural aptitude for yeah. it. And I think my dad and my mom put a good work ethic in me. So if, if you wanted me here at one o'clock I was here at one o'clock yeah um, yeah you, you definitely were always on time I remember that distinctly you know and I that's a big thing for me because I like people that are you know they even come in a few minutes early yeah you know it's more important that they come here early and, are, and they're willing to learn but anyway I want to get back and ask you another question so that was good so that was how was how was I as a worker I'm glad to hear that Bob you never know what your impression yeah. the impression you leave on people um, this well, it's amazing that after these many years, we're still, we still keep in touch. Yeah, there's a connection there. Yeah. Getting back to uh, the questions, what do you think is the most dangerous tool in a wood shop? The most dangerous? <sighs> they're all dangerous. They're all the serious pieces of equipment that could hurt you. You just got to respect them. You know, I, I, I wouldn't say one is more uh, dangerous than the other. You know, like if, you, if you're cautious and you think and you don't take a chance, you know, you don't take risk. You, you, you just be very careful. Make sure you think it out before you push it into this, to, to the blade and you, you, won't get, you won't get hurt. It's just when you're careless and you're not thinking and you got things on your mind. That's why I got out of the shop because I had too many things going. I had to design it, I had to sell it, I had to do the finishing, I had to do the building, and it was just too much. So that's why I went in, into painting, where I could have my time uh, painting, designing furniture, making sure the shop was running, and it, it worked better for me. Here's a technical question. What is your go-to finish for clear for clear lacquer? For clear that, anything. That's what we use, clear lacquer. Why do you like lacquer? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's harder. It's, uh, we, we use catalyzed lacquer, pre-cat or catalyzed, and it's very hard. It's great for tabletops. You know, I wouldn't use a, a varnish or a shellac. They're too weak. Varnishes are, are better than a shellac base, but... Um, a varnish, what they're taking out of the varnishes today, they're, they're ruining the product. So 
Uh, if you really want a nice hard finish, you get a nice uh, lacquer from a manufacturer that you, you know, that you, I've used the same manufacturer for years, but um, I always, I changed from regular catalyzed lacquer, now I'm using uh, pre-cat, and then I went into catalyst. <clears throat> what about for painted cabinets? Painted cabinets, I'll tell you what we've been using. We used to use oil paint by Benjamin Moore. We used to always use um, Imperva. And then they started taking everything out of it. They made it weaker and weaker and weaker, and then they, they're not allowed to sell the gallons anymore. They started selling in quarts, and it was too expensive. So then they came out with a product called Advance, which is a water base. It is excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I can't tell you how great it is. And how do you apply it? We spray everything. We were spraying everything. And you cut it, do you cut it with anything or you just yeah, spray? Yeah, we cut it with, uh, we usually cut it with a little bit of water. Just clean water? Yep. <clears throat> do you ever use pocket holes? Have you guys ever used pocket holes like the Craig jig? All the time. See, I like pocket holes. A lot of woodworkers out there have uh, an issue with pocket well, as holes. as long as you can hide them. How has the woodworking business changed over the years? Well, it went from hand tools to, to computers, which is everything's run on a, a CNC today. So you really don't have to be a, a, a craftsman. You can just be, just be a guy that runs a computer and knows what he's doing on a computer and you feed the information into the computer and what you want comes out. And it's amazing to see the carvings they can do on a computer. It's amazing. I, I've, I, I've carved over the years and it's amazing to see the quality of the work that can come off a computer. Do you have any interest in learning None. CNC? None whatsoever. How come? I almost bought one, thought about it, but we never had anybody to run it. So that's probably why I was always afraid of it. So now we're leaving the shop. This is where everything is made and we're going into the showroom and Bob you can just show us around yeah pretty much everything in here you've made everything yeah did you make all these paintings I made every one of the paintings I painted every one of them yeah every one I just painted on masonite a quarter inch masonite, uh, MDF do you like painting on masonite yeah MDF not MDF. masonite different Medium, and, medium density board, quarter inch. Yeah, this is a nice painting too. Do you know where this is? Hudson River. Oh, no, no, Delaware River. I'm sorry, the Delaware Water Gap. Delaware Water Gap. Yeah. Did you make the small table underneath it? Yeah. Yeah. Now you didn't make the chairs. That's the chairs we finish. Okay. We don't make chairs. Can I open the drawer? Yeah, sure. And dovetail. Now, do you use a uh, a dovetail a dovetail jig for that? No. Really? So. Who did you do that or Bill? Maybe um maybe um maybe the kid that worked for him was in Princeton. So you got hand dovetails in the front. Yeah, it was a kid that. Uh, and then on the sides, you just nail the back. Yeah. Well, we plow it out. We plow it out. Hmm. Let's take a look at the bottom of the drawer. And we glue it. Now that looks, that yeah. almost looks like Baltic birch plywood for the... It is Baltic birch. That's nice. Yeah. That's a nice, nice touch there. Baltic birch. This reminds me of something that you do a lot of. This here? Built-ins. We used to, yeah. We used to make a lot of these built-ins. You know, this colonial look is dead, you know? Nobody wants colonial look. What do they want now? Contemporary. Everything's straight lines, square cut, paint it white. Does that make it easier for you as a woodworker, or did it? Well, this was more interesting, you know, for us, you know? This was more interesting. Well, yeah. we, I used to have an art class right here. Okay. All those easels that you saw in the back, I had <laughs> ten of them. Here, we'll set up, and that's, we had a model stand, model came in, we did portraits. When did you do that? For the last year. 
On Saturdays? No, no, during the week. Oh, it was actually Wednesday. During the day? Every Wednesday during the day, people wow. would come in here and paint, you know? Now this is a big cabinet. Was this designed to be a TV cabinet? This was designed to be a file cabinet. Huh. You know? Now this painting right here, John, I don't know if you, don't, you recognize that, but that's the, um, that's the Sandy Hook. Um, um, oh, one, of the, one of those houses? Yeah, on, on, yeah. The, on the beach. Yep. On the beach. Now this is an interesting piece of furniture. Can you tell me anything about this? Because just the scale is different. I designed it. It has a, a, a cabrio leg, a French leg. You know, this is all one post. And then we, we, we chamfered this off and made the leg. And then um, I hand painted it. Yeah, I like the paint job a lot. Yeah, I hand painted that. And then we made these table. I designed this so it got to be a little more contemporary. Yep, that's definitely got a much more contemporary look. So this has always been the showroom. This was always the showroom, yeah. It's a great thing to have. Yeah. Did you make this piece? Yeah, nice. Oh, that's decorative painting. Faux finished it. Yeah, it's a great faux finish. At first I thought it was a veneer. No. This is all faux finished. Yeah. That was a big thing that I think I learned here was finishing. Yeah. We did a lot of glazing. Yeah. That's really neat. That's that's really neat. I like that. So did you use the the uh, Mohawk glaze for that? That's what we always used to use. Probably. An oil based glaze, then you lay, then you lacquer over it? Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. You got a built in over here. Or not a built-in. Now this is kind of more contemporary, is it? It's Chinese. Okay. This was this was built in China. This piece. This piece every year opens up. Well, it cracks open up. That oh, you didn't build that. No, but I did. I, I manufactured another one. It looks exactly like it because this piece was cracking on the lady all the time. Every time it would change during the, during the different seasons. So they would, um, they hated it. And so I, I took it from them. I made another one exactly like this. And they have the other one at a maple. They never had a problem with it, you know? But we did the same draw front, everything. What kind of wood do you think that's made out of? This, this here? Yeah. This is probably some type of a mahogany from, from, uh, from China. Yeah. I don't know what kind of wood, really, but I think it's mahogany of some sort. This looks like something that we would have made when I was working towards the end. This here? Yeah. Yeah. We used to, now this was probably a TV cabinet. That was a great, all right, right. And, and there, these are the butt hinges. Yeah. And this is, this is like a door that starts here, goes there, and wraps around the cabinet. Double hinged. I never saw anything like that. See, it's got a hinge for the, for the column. Oh yeah, that's great. Different, huh? Very beautiful cherry piece. Yeah. The one easel that I really made is um, <clears throat> um, it's at my, my house that I'm sure that I really like. Bob, I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, anytime, John. Yeah, and I'm sure I'll run into you. Yeah. You're gonna miss. You're gonna miss this art studio. I'm gonna miss this whole place. <laughs> you are. You've been here a long time. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to make an art studio at least. Well, I've been thinking about putting an addition on top of my garage down here. Well, I have a studio down here. It's into my garage, but it's nothing like this. You want to have some height. Yeah. And There's some... something about being a little higher. I think. Yeah. That's where my art studio is on the second floor. Are you got ceilings this high? No, they're not this high. I wish they were. Yeah. I can't complain. Was that born there when you bought it? Or? That's why we bought the property. It oh. was it was falling down. We jacked it up. The whole second floor is new. Oh, you added that second floor on? No, we just took off the old one oh. and put a new one on. It was all rotting away. Um, and um, basically turned it into a, a workable building. Yeah. But it was all rotting away. It still needs work. It's like anything. You always got to keep on top of it. 